Unfinished business, the minutes of February 24th, 2022, which really dates the frequency of this commission. Yeah. <laughs> so I wasn't part of the commission then, so I'm going to abstain from voting. So I'm going to have to consider the minutes. And then we have a quorum we could adopt it. That's a good Okay. So we're going to. So we will those. pass yeah. the minutes from February 24th to be continued. Okay. Um, New business intergovernmental agreement discussion with Delta County planning. I bet that's the reason I met two people walking in. The floor is all yours. I can say, you want to uh, introduce yourselves for the recording? Sure. Um, I'm Carl Holm. I'm the planning director for, for Delta County. I'm Angie Kemp. I'm a planner. Okay. So what we want to do is come and uh, talk, we're talking with all the towns about the intergovernmental agreement. County adopted uh, land use code January 2021. Part of that included putting zoning around the towns. And uh, most of the areas immediately adjacent to the towns, we designated as an urban growth area zoning designation. Um, we also have A5, A20, A35, with minimum acreage being the number that's reflected. And then we have a rural industrial commercial zoning designation, which is a two acre minimum. The UGA is 7,500 square foot minimum, anticipating connection to sewer, water, you know, urban, urban services. Um, so one of the things that we're doing right now is updating our land use code. We're gonna add a couple of residential designations, a one acre minimum, a two and a half acre minimum. Cause that was, we found things like that just kind of missing as people wanted to, um, put forward development plans. It's like, well, I just want one acre. I want two and a half acre. Can't get there without having the, the proper zoning. It really wasn't intended for industrial or commercial use or residential. Um, so we, we think that will be a, a plus going forward um, in, in the, the land use code. Um, but then also with the, the intergovernmental agreements, as we're doing development review, some of the things we've found as we've and kind of just uncovering things. We got a lot of new people at the county, myself. I started the end of January, 2021. Um, Angie is, is relatively new, starting with the county. Our environmental health director is relatively new. Um, so there's been a lot of institutional knowledge left as far as what was intended by the land use code. So I'm just going based on how I read and interpret it. And that's not necessarily how it was intended, but what I want to do is go through and clean up things that maybe I'm interpreting that was intended to be some, something different so that we're doing it the way everybody had expected. But also then talk about the, the, um, the IGAs and how we want to work around the municipalities. Um, water's become a real big issue. Um, we are requiring site plan review for all projects and the land use code has allowed uses and says allowed by right, but there was an ordinance that was um, adopted in 2011. It's called for development applications and it starts with a site plan review. That wasn't being done. Um, I've started doing that as, as just a, a standard practice so that we get a site plan and show setbacks because people are building and setbacks over easements, you know, different things. Because so they they look an aerial plot and say, here's here's a good place to build. Um, and there were other encumbrances on the property that really weren't getting picked up or a subdivision was approved with a plat note that wasn't getting picked up, you know, limiting one unit and they wanted to put a second unit on. So we're catching a lot of things up front, which then makes it smoother for when they want to get their access and septic permits. When we have projects that are near the municipalities, we're sending them out for referral. Again, early in the process of basically a pre-application before we get very far in, into the process. Um, and so that's an opportunity for the town to decide, do we want to annex it and process it? Or we, we have the intergovernmental agreement, you know, we're gonna, and we've, we're trying to follow that because um, 
I don't know how much that's been done. I know you have the Highway 133 corridor plan. Uh, so one of the questions I have for you also is relative to that plan, it's, it's very clearly part of the IGA that we implement the standards in that. When I read the plan, there's two areas, area A and B, but I, I don't see much reference to area B. I see a lot of discussion about what should happen in area A. Um, the IGA map though includes both areas. So that's one of the things I wanna talk about is what is the town expectation for growth around its borders? Um, or where would you be wanting to connect sewer and water if, if a project came in? Where would be willing to you know, at least have the conversation? Um, and focusing on those areas, uh, how, how we specifically want to process those to, so that when the town is ready to annex, if that's the intent, that it's, it's done more so it's just falling right into what the town would do if it was built within a town. Question, do you look at um, scenic byways and try to go by their guidelines when you're looking at roads that are outside of the town, but part of the scenic byway? The only reference in our land use code to the scenic byway is that development is within a quarter mile of the scenic byway. So yes, we do. Um, there aren't any real specific standards about that other than we want to make sure that we look at it from an aesthetic perspective. We don't have any design standards. Um, but they do. But they do, yes. So in that case, we would, that's where we would look. That's what we're trying to do is, is wherever there is something that's, that's where we fall back to. Okay. And I'd like a clarification when you say uh, the application for places near town, yeah. what's your definition of near? Well, if it's within the, the growth management area specifically. So that, that's why we want to talk about what is that growth management area boundary that you would want projects to be referred to the town for review. You know, there's a small group in here. I want to keep this in for so sure. as we go along, you're okay with us asking questions. Absolutely. Uh, and then we'll see the round table or discussion or kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. They will kind of treat it like a work session. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Is that okay with everyone? That's great. And since we're so small, could you reintroduce yourself? We had something else added. And okay. then if members of the public want to introduce themselves, that'd be fine too. Because I think some are out of town, some are. Okay. I'm Carl Holm. I'm the director of planning for Delta County. I'm Angie Kemp. I'm a planner with Delta County. James Hartson, Price Road. Steve Patterson, Price Road. Shane yeah. Patterson, Rio Grande Avenue. So two are related and two are neighbors. <laughs> yeah. I picked up the same last name, but I wasn't going to assume anything. So. And two are out of town. Uh, 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 I have a question related to what you talked about with the A and B. Is that on a schematic? The it's it's the schematic within the Highway 133 plan. Is it in the packet? That's not accurate to refer to. Okay, thank you. I do have a map here if you want to see it. There's a map right a copy. Sure. Thirteen on the back. Um, you know, so the, the intergovernmental agreement also talks about the town annexing enclaves, uh, what happens with roads along the edges when we annex the um, the the. The desire of the county is when, if there's a, a property that's annexed at the edge of the, the town, that the road adjacent to that would also be annexed so that the, the town would then uh, take that road over. Um, it talks about connecting the sewer if it's with the 400 feet of a sewer main. Um, we've had some projects where, even though it's within 400 feet of one of the municipalities, they didn't want to annex it. Um, so, you know, we, at that point, we're falling back to it's a one acre minimum. And if, if it was zoned UGA, where otherwise it would allow 7,500 square feet. If they're on septic, we're, we're requiring a one acre minimum. Okay. Um, Do you know what the Delta County joke was about that when I first moved here? <laughs> and this is the last county in Colorado where you could still legally use Volkswagen bus as a septic tank. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I've, I've heard all sorts of, of things. <laughs> yeah, <often. laughs> so, uh, and I've, I've seen all sorts of things that have happened. <laughs> that was 20 years ago. Now it's a Subaru. Um, one of the other things that we've had discussions about is the land use code talks about no cisterns for residential uses. Um, so any new development would have to have a water connection. That's been problematic in some areas that they don't, they can't get a well. There's, there's no municipal water. There's no spring. There, there is no other water source. So I've had the conversation with the board about in those cases to have maybe like a variance process or something to, to look at that and say, okay, in this case, we will allow a cistern for the first single family home. So that it's not an undeveloped piece of property. We wouldn't subdivide that into multiple homes, um, but to allow them at least to have some reasonable use of the property. That's the same thing. Now. Yeah, that's a. Um, I'm really glad to thinking about modifications like that because some of these spaces here is impossible. Right. My wife and I lived outside uh, west of Flagstaff for 17 years, all water the whole time. There was no way we could get at right. a water source. There was no municipal water source. Right, so um, I'm glad you're allowing cisterns accessory, especially families who can't afford to live in town and stuff. It's affordability thing that helps families be sure. able to um, afford land because that's the way we were. We couldn't afford land close to flight. Yeah, so we had to get 25 miles outside of time. And then there's no loss, right? Obviously, if there is the ability to connect to the municipal water, that would be the ideal. That would be. Right. Or they can get a well, having a cistern with a well, at least it's a water source on the property. They're permitted for that. You know, that's a different matter where you're putting it into a cistern to get to be able to pressurize the system. You know, that's different than hauling water. Yeah. And it's the hauled water that we're, we want to be not just absolute no, but, you know, that's the last resort. Yeah. We don't have any 30 or 40 houses right in the same area that all the water. Right. 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 Do you um, work with CDOT at all because of the possibility of changing up on Rogers Mesa, the outside of town road? We do. If a property takes access from the highway, we, ha we have CDOT review it. If there's a subdivision that actually, you know, any subdivision actually, we refer to CDOT. Because some of them aren't necessarily right directly taking access off the highway, but indirectly, and CDOT will want some improvements to where they're where they're coming into the highway. Okay. So we do that regularly, yes. Well, I know when we were looking at this the last time, one of the things that came up, and I it was included in our packet, was just um, confined animal. Feeding operations, right, was. right. And I went back to the land use plan. And I tried to find a definition in the Delta County land use plan for a CFO for a small CFO, because I know we're talking no medium, no large right. in our town's growth area. Right. But I couldn't find a definition for small. It's well, it'd just be yeah below the threshold of, of medium. I mean, they're really yeah. You're right. There isn't a specific definition for small, but it's anything up to what that medium. Would be. And I don't remember what is the top for medium? I, I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay. Because my thought is, you know, there's. I know there was a big issue with when it came through the language code, but there hasn't been any inquiries about it since I've been here. Okay. So. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Like buy from the moment. Yeah. But still, I, that's something you know, that I would definitely advocate that we don't have any CFOs. In our urban growth area at all. Even the small ones. Yeah, even the small ones. Okay. And again, what's the definition of the small? You right. have a chicken coop with 20 chickens in it. I mean, is that considered a small one? Or so yeah, there needs to be a clear definition. Okay. Of that. And that's you know, if, if you're if you've experienced things like that that you're not seeing in the land use code. I mean, no, now's a good time because we're going through and, and trying to clean that up. And um, things like even defining between a mobile home park versus a, a campground and RV parks and, and those types of things weren't real cleanly defined. Um, 
prior to the land use code, there was a resolution that talked about mobile home park being three or three or more mobile homes or RVs. Well, the number went away when the land use code was adopted. It just has a mobile home park if it's you know set up where there's spaces for for mobile homes. What does that mean? Two, three? You know how how many? Because um, within the county, we still you know have mobile homes as a an affordable type of housing. Um, RVs can be a permanent residence if they're connected to sewer, water, and electricity, permanent infrastructure. Other than that, they can only be in them for 90 days. Yeah. Just a little background. When I first joined the council a couple of years ago, there was a huge controversy. It had to do with maintaining our downtown businesses and the proposal to put a family dollar out of the highway. So I want to be really clear with you that you understand what that controversy well and what the council passed as a result of that. Okay. So our current one of our current council members, Thomas Marco, was a leader in this as a citizen that came forward and said, there's a way to be able to stop this. And what the council adopted is a prohibition to formula businesses. The formula business is decide, defined as any business that has, I think, five or more sites throughout the United States that are identical. So what that does is it stops most of the fast foods, it stops the Starbucks, it stops those corporate interests that really tend to come to a community and gouge the community, you know, ruin the downtown business area. So that's one thing I want to make sure that you're aware of. It's a hot button issue for family. It's really big. Now, the downside of that was people that were more, um, that didn't have that were more in poverty or barely making it, they were very much in favor of having a family, family dollar here because it could save them money. Our grocery stores are relatively expensive. We used to have a drugstore here that was relatively more expensive. And so they were looking forward to that. It was a controversy in the community, but the formula business was passed. We grandfathered the only one we had, which was Subway, and it subsequently has gone out of business. So. Yeah. Pardon? I know Napa's one, yeah, Ace yeah. Hardware is another here. one. It's locally owned, but yeah. you know, we're trying to, it, it isn't, I don't know if Napa would hit that thing because it isn't identical to every shop, maybe not. Well, and one of the other things was wearing a uniform, the, all the employees had to wear a uniform. There were right. several criteria yeah. that yeah. And I don't know if Napa meets that definition, but Subway definitely did. Yeah, yeah. Subway and, did. Um, they went out of business, so we don't have any right now. So that'd be really important on the highway one, two, three corridor. What's right. also important is how that corridor impacts downtown businesses because commercial businesses that directly, like Root and Wine, it's a great place, but it does detract from the restaurants and stuff that are here. So there's big bees. So um, bird harvest is in the city, right? So it's not quite so much. But that's one thing I know has been a hot button issue. and. We have we want to maintain a thriving downtown and a thriving core of the town. One of the things that's really precious about Payon is the fact that we don't have this giant corridor coming through the middle of us like a lot of other towns. I say yeah, sixty-five we're off. But then the fact that we're off off also decreases their visibility. So anything that takes away from that downtown vibrancy is really And being able to include some of that. I mean, it is kind of written into the Highway 133 plan as yeah. well. And that was some of the basis for setting up that legislation in the first place. Right. But I think, you know, we need to revisit the Highway yeah. 133 corridor plan yeah. as well. It wasn't it um, thrown out, though? Wasn't the, <clears throat> I thought there was something happening with Highway 133 corridor and the agreements with the county about how we we're treating the outside land. That those are agreements were not on board for a while. No, no, and that was a misunderstanding when they put in the land use plan. Is that because of the zoning from the right. county that all our agreements were going away? And that oh. was not true because it's written into the. It is written into the IGA specifically. Well, and it's written. Uh, but also, the when the land use code was adopted, um, a number of uh, previous regulations were repealed: the subdivision standards, specific development permit standards. Um, it talked about all the number of different land use standards, but Highway 133 and the Highway 92 overlay district near Delta, those were specifically kept. 
and, and not the ITAs were also specifically right. identified as, that as, plan right. as, being as still continue. Right. right. Um, but this is the first conversation having, you know, what do we want to do with the IGA since the land use code was adopted? So whatever you're seeing happening, you know, like you said, just kind of what you're experiencing and what you want to try to accomplish with the town, you know, not having, not, what, is, what do you want to see from the IGA of development in the county area? You know, if, if we we go back and we kind of take take out the UGA zoning, which I, I'm I'm recommending. Oh, really? Yes. And, oh. and looking at either residential or commercial, either you know type type of zoning or ag. You know, there's some some towns that have prime agricultural lands next to them that they don't want to see developed. Then we would we would zone that accordingly. What is UGA? Oh. Urban growth area. And what that allowed was a, a higher density, so uh, 7,500 7, square uh, feet per lot, rather than the, the other smallest was two acres for rural industrial commercial or five acres. So we're looking at adding a couple zoning designations with a one acre minimum and a two and a half acre minimum for residential purposes. So we're trying to find the right balance uh, near the towns. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. If you're quote zoning business are they required to meet standards of commercial buildings when you say standards there's the land use standards we don't have building codes in the county still and that was something that i know hotchkiss is pushing for and frankly i would push for too is that that the county enforce within our, you know, whatever that area is going to be designated now that the county and right. first building. Right. And I think when we when we talk about what that area is, I think that's what we want to be thinking about. If you're going to be providing services, you certainly want it to be built according to town standards, which includes building codes. The challenge for the county with that is we don't have a building department. Um, so we would want to address that, that maybe, for example, if it's within that area right next to the town, that it be subject to the building codes per the town and actually go through the permitting process for the building permit with the town. Something to that effect. I haven't worked it all out, but in the conversations I've had with Hoshkas and, and um, the other towns. I bet we'll have some comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, 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 and the board may not be on that same page. I, I, well, you know, but, well, our audit town residents. They've addressed this before on these kind of issues. And I think it's important since you're the county mm -hmm. that you hear where they stand. We do any heck no. I mean, that's the reason I didn't buy it. Um, that and, and several others. And it sort of brings up another issue of our entire street, there is one house out of what? That would agree to annexation. The rest of us want nothing to do with it. So, what do you do in that situation? Well, it's ultimately up to the town whether yeah. or not they're going to annex. The county isn't involved in that at all. Yeah. The county is not involved in that? Nope. Yeah. Uh -huh. so if we decide to annex, then we annex. I mean, that's part of that agreement about this, what is now urban growth area, is that something comes to the, to the Either the well, it comes to Delta County or the town, and right. then we decide who has jurisdiction. Exactly. Who's going to take the, the, the process? Who's lead on the process? Right. Right. Well, when the last manager was here, we wanted to sort of annex our area a little bit under the radar, and we just happened to be at that meeting, and it was like as an afterthought. Oh, while we're annexing Stall Road, let's put Price Road in that chopping block, and. That was not agendized, it was not protocol, and that's what had us all on Price Road get everybody in that neighborhood and go to the county commissioners and say, please don't annex us because Peonia has is overwhelmed with their own stuff. They can't clear their roads with snow, they can't clean their roads, they can't fill a pile there. And we love that. Delta County can come and Price Road is clear and Price Road is taken care of. And also that manager um, was looking at putting the sewer line to the cost of about close to a million dollars for that Price Road, doing the deep core drilling. 
telling us that's not what was going on and trying to get that sewer line all the way up to, you know, stop and say that where he lived on the end of that line also. So I'm just wondering where that money is going to come from. If you're trying to annex things, well, where is the, you're going to have to put everybody on sewer to be and, annexed into the town. And at this point, we're not talking about annexing anything or anyone. We the talk about move, uh, continuing with the sewer line out to stop and save. There's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, their septic system is failing. And so they would really like to hook up to town sewer. And it would give us tax revenue from there because we could annex that if we had. It's that we can't wait a flagpole annexation when you go out and annex one little piece. And that would prevent us from doing that. So. You know, at this point, we have no plans to annex anything. And if we put in that sewer line, then it, it, we're going to have to find a way to do that without annexing. Stop and save. And also, my concern is the carrying capacity of our, our, our existing sewer plant, which is, you know, has years to be talked about that, what's going on there. So I'm just letting Delta County know all these things are happening in this town. And we've got a lot of things that we need to deal with, with our own water system, sewer system, before sort of like accessing and exploring other areas that are sort of perfectly fine with where they're at. That's all. We're probably figuring out the economy of it. I mean, if you're annexing just to get the revenue from the taxation of the, you know, property value tax, is, it's like it doesn't really add up because then you have to you know, build, figure out the sewer system. And then it, 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 there's a lot of things. That's all. Yeah, and agreed. There's yeah. a lot of things that go into that, which is why, I mean, we have enough on our plate. We know we're right. talking about the annexation. Plus the fact that you don't want James Sorensen on the council. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> actually, I wouldn't mind having James on the council. He flirts, though. Oh dear, we <laughs> wouldn't want that. <laughs> 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 We've known each other for almost 30 years. <laughs> Neither of us were great. <laughs> <laughs> I treasure 28 of them. Yeah. <laughs> good, thanks so much. <laughs> So anyway, it, it is a topic that's come up before as far as building codes um, in within the growth management area. Recognizing that the IJ is the intent of kind of a transition, you know, the lands that could transition for annexation, but also how it affects the town and, and how the town develops. So um, I think it's worth a conversation and I, I know that there's very strong views on both sides of that. So if we're, let's say, very a thought about price where we would, what would put us under the uh, purview of the talent for building codes? That's what, the, that's what we're here to talk, to talk about with the IGA is how, where, where that boundary would be. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to follow the Highway 133 plan or, you know, not the three mile growth boundary, but more of, you know, where is the town looking to really grow services? If, if you are going to expand the sewer main, sewer main, water lines, that type of thing, where would where might that be? I think that would be more of a conversation uh, where we'd be really looking at focusing where development might, uh, might annex at some point. And I'm thinking too, so if we were to ask that building codes be enforced in this area, uh, we would be grandfathering you know. Already there. Oh, so we would be coming absolutely. back and saying, no, you need to upgrade your building and whatever. Yeah, you know, that just is ridiculous. Right. Yeah, it's like we're talking new construction. Yes. Yeah, new construction. Absolutely. Right. It would it would be very monumental task to try to oh, do God. anything other than that. And, and really <laughs> draconian. And, and very, and very or, controversial. Or, yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> You guys carrying today. Well, I mean, when, when you develop it, once you get your permit or, and your approval, or you know, if there is a permit required, once you're once you're there and you've started, local government can't come come in and say, nope, we're going to take it back. That's a stop. So we don't want to get into that that realm and say, no, you got to play by different. You have to play by the rules that are in place at the time you come in. That's why it would be new construction going. 
Well, we had a uh, strategic planning session here on just this past Saturday. Those are we had 22 citizens at the beginning. Mm -hmm. We ended up with 52 in the afternoon. It was a session that started at 10 and finished at 3. And Mary was really a big driver of that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's it really it's a lot of effort on your part. But it yielded a lot of information from the public and stuff, so that will really help us in what we're trying to do in the master plan. Okay. And that, yeah, this is all going to be part of our master planning process. It has to be part of our master planning right. process to kind of pick this out and say, well, let's look at this without looking at the big plan seems kind of silly at this point. Yeah, and that's what we've been balancing too, because the land use code grew out of the master plan, the 2018 county master plan. We had had some conversations with the planning commission about looking at the master plan, but then as we were doing the implementation and things weren't necessarily coming forward the way the board had anticipated, we moved into the land use code update. And now then we'll go back and take a look at the, at the master plan. Because the master plan really was just focusing on getting a land use code in place. That was a, that was a big focus in that plan. So now we've got to go back to with the land use code now in place. What's the vision? What's the, what's the strategic plan for the, for the county? So this process, you're coming before the planning commission right now, and we're giving you some input. Where does the council fit in this? This is kind of the initial stage of just having a conversation. There were Mary and I were talking about the, you know, there were some initial conversations about the IGA when I first came on, and there had been reference to previous meetings about going through and updating the, the all the IGAs with the land use code having been adopted. I'm going around all the municipalities just saying, what do you want to see in the plan? We we came up with kind of some, some standards that were already in a lot of the plans, um, going into the cisterns and sewer and, and that type of thing. But then what is town specific uh, points that we want to hit on that I would go back and draft an idea and then come back to the, the towns as well as having a conversation with the board. I may even want to have this conversation with the board on the draft before even going out to that next round to make sure I'm not too far astray. I think that um, and just reflect what I've had with the conversations. Here's kind of a draft of, of you know what we're looking at, um, get some feedback, and then be able to come back and have an actual document to, to speak to. In addition, I can I can speak to where we are with the land use code update at that point too. We have a very activist board that really wants to be involved. In this. So the draft idea is a really good, good first step to come to that. That was something I cast in so I found that to <laughs> That's why we have pre application needs. Before somebody goes, hires a surveyor, and has it all dialed in, let's, let's have a conversation. We might want to adjust a little bit without a lot of, lot of bloodshed. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and do you have a timeline on this? Um, I'm trying to get through the land use codes uh, with the planning commission um, as there's time. We haven't had any special meetings. I'd like to be done with this by the end of the calendar year. So okay. I think that's that's a pretty realistic. Time. Yeah. Is there much difference between the different towns, or Not is it pretty much everyone's looking at it the same way? I think everybody's really looking at it the same way. Everybody's dealing with the water issues. Everybody's dealing with the traffic issues. There's affordable housing. How do we get keep housing affordable? I mean, those are all the, the kind of the, the basis. Um, not having a lot of capacity for big infrastructure projects. Um, so not, you know, most of the towns are not looking to really grow, but more of the infill. How do we deal with what we have inside? That's it. And then, but then how, how do we operate the county so that we're not impacting the towns? Because whatever we do on your border impacts your services. True. Yeah. Yeah. True. So area A in particular basically encompasses the West Bay on your water company. Um, what happens to that water company if that area becomes annexed? Does the city then take over the water company? Yes. So. Yeah. Should you hand up to? So when they take over the water company, right now we're restricted to, I believe, a two-inch line, which doesn't meet code of any kind. Yeah. Would the city then be required to upgrade that to a six-inch line? I know that's a great question. 
upon annexation what the yeah. town is uh, but there would we would have we would part of that would be a plan to update the one yes it would it doesn't have to happen immediately for annexation no um but it would have to be part of the plan it is the if you're not meeting the requirement for so right now with a water company you have to meet the requirement for a certain amount of pressure at the at the master meter and in a situation like that where you would be taking them into the water company then we would be required to meet the pressure requirements at the end of the line so uh, if there was line if there had to be a modification of the size of line that would have to be part of the line which we sort of do because we have a restricted line so it raises that pressure but um, there was a, an agreement way before any of our time, probably, that they restricted the air to each line. Um, and I mean, it's servicing everybody, but to be told, it would have to be a six inch line. I'd have to confirm that. What the, last, yeah, the I line size, I don't know if it's four inches or six inches. Yeah. Uh, two things. Um, as speaking as a property owner in town, um, there is a lot of need or wants of other property owners to have a. Um, so that's one thing that isn't really being seriously looked at, even though it's been in the conversation since a couple of years, but it's kind of ignored. And that means also to looking at sharing water taps with the uh, principal water tap pump, pump, which is a doable thing, but perhaps not either. The other thing is annexing where it makes sense. Uh, for instance, just one example is Fifth Street, where uh, you know, and Grand Avenue also to the bridge, you know, and kind of using that border of the river as kind of like the town limit and not going beyond that for it. At least in the first stage type of thing. Um, going up where there's things like Hawks Haven, which was originally meant to be annexed. And all of a sudden, oops, that is dropped. But there's places where it's sensible to annex and bring that into town. And things to change in the code, for instance, with um, but it is a question of the uh, moratorium, of course, and that still isn't dealt with. They getting the data and getting, um, you know, the focus on that water, getting that uh, finished and, you know, tied up. So those two things. But anyway, go ahead. But I'm glad you brought up ADUs because do you have any kind of restrictions or regulations on ADUs or Airbnbs or anything like that in the county code at all? Not from a land use perspective, but you still have to be show that you have the water flow. So um, if it requires a second water tap, you need to make sure be able to get that second water tap. But from a land use perspective, you can have two units. It's an allowed use. That, so that would include ADUs. Yeah. Is there going to be any cut? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'd like to talk a bit oh, about God. water. <laughs> Can I just add something? Is that two units on one water tap in the county? Or? Well, we don't, we don't, we don't handle the water part of it. So right. we want, we'll look to the water provider, right. well permit, whatever that water source is, that they can, you know, support that secondary unit. Okay. Well, kind here of, there's kind of um, people slipping by with multiple properties or multiple oh. units on the same water. Right, I've uh, seen that people with property, individual properties, aren't uh, privy to that. And there is still some feeling within the county that I could just build whatever I want to build. Yeah. And that, so that is still happening. Not everybody is coming in and going through the process. We understand that. Um, we're, we do have a co compliance officer, but it's on a reactive basis. We don't go out looking for it. I think that's something to respect, too. <laughs> yes. Property is a thing about that. It's an advantage of living in the town. But anyway, we're in, I'm in town, so it's restricted. Hi, I'd like to talk a little bit about water. I've been here 28 plus years. We farmed out on Stewart Mesa for 18 years. 
I sat on the domestic water board and I sat on the ditch water board. What happens is I know at least three water companies that have an agreement with the town of Paonia that it's two taps. And the first tap is for a home. The second tap is only for animals. If you drive from Slate Point Road into town, there are nine properties in violation of this. And if the town, my feeling is if the town could go to these water companies and put a second meter on all these places that people have leased out, rented out on their property um, and charge a water difference on that, we'd have plenty of water. Because if you just take a three mile drive, nine, seven, nine violations, right there, just from Slate Point into the railroad tracks and beyond. And I think it's something that the town has to start uh, requiring the water companies to do. Now, our agreement was written in 1919, so it's old. And of course, it's senior, and we have senior rights. We're the second, we're the we're second after the town of Paonia, uh, mainly because our we had the springs um, that were sold to the town of Paonia back in 1918 or whatever. So if you just took the people that are in violation and put a made the water companies put a second tap and charge different for them. Now the people that own the property that are leasing it, they can try to change the rents cost due to the water. But there's, I mean, just the ones on the dry down from Slate Point Road, there's hundreds more, hundreds more of people that are in violation of the water requirements um, put out by the town of Paonia. Is that even right somewhere or recorded somewhere? Those? Yeah, I, I, I read through all the different um, water company agreements and could only find three that that was written into the agreements. But I living here, I think it was up two or 99. James probably remembers, they were getting ready to shut off water, like to Bone Mesa. I mean, that's domestic water. We were in such a drought at that time. But- um, So treated water, domestic water. It's domestic water deliverance that the town of Paonia does to the 27 different water companies. 27 different water companies. It's not all treated water. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. it's everything except for up on Pitkin Mesa. And uh, what? Yeah, that's out of our control. Yeah, so, it's everything on the south side of 133. So part of the talk in the strategic planning session on Saturday was about the possibility of whether all of those get combined into an overarching water in the hands of Thing rather than just the town of Paonia trying to figure out those pieces back in the um, Were there other parts that you wanted to deal with with us? And I have a question about law enforcement. And how that works. Um, I probably won't have an answer for law enforcement, but I, um, I just want to touch on one thing that came up. You know, there, there was the possibility of having like what we'll call a hard edge that the town doesn't want to grow into prime agricultural land or across the river. It was mentioned something along those lines. Um, so this is kind of a planning document as well. You know, where do we want to try to not, and then of course, then you wouldn't want the county developing right there. You're going to say, we don't want that developed. That would, that's part of the IGA saying this area will stay agriculture. 
you know, so it doesn't have to, it's not just all about development, it's also about where do we not want to grow, where do we want to keep the agricultural plants. Protect the, open space. the good open, open space, agricultural lands, yeah, that type of thing. So based on some of what you, you've heard in here, then you'll come back with a draft for the council. Correct. And review, and that'll be their first introduction to it. So make sure we're starting at the ground level. Right. Yep. Great. Anything else from anyone? And did you both meet them? I'm, I was neglecting introductions. <laughs> I didn't say anything about staff. I apologize. I, I met them. Okay. Yeah. I just met him with same Okay. Well, I would hope that all of the you know facts and figures and uh, economic sense are really easily laid out. So it makes sense for everybody to see like, oh, we're annexing this and that makes, that's reasonable and that makes sense. And maybe you have a protocol or a list of, as a county of that sort of the bullet points and the outline and the economic, uh, economic value. Return, return on us. Yeah, return on Yeah, I mean, right. for it to make sense, because that's all. It's really more the town that will be doing that because they're the ones taking over that that responsibility. So it's they're doing that economic analysis of, of you know cost benefit. We would be taking capital, capital costs, yeah. whatever. Yeah. We would be taking land from the county versus the county taking land from us. So it would make sense that we would lay out that versus we'll never stop the information yeah. for it to make sense. That's all. Yeah. I would be at looking for. Yeah. So, anything else on this agenda item? I have one local thing. <laughs> just to say, um, <clears throat> building codes. Um, I'm from Ohio. My grandmother was in the Collinwood Fire, and you've probably never heard of it. There were 420 children burned up in a fire in a school back in, um, it was earlier than the 20s and the teens, I think. And um, it's because the doors opened in. And so nationwide, the code is for doors to always open out. And it was because of that school fire. And it's something I am so aware of when I go into different buildings and whatnot, and you can't get out the door if it's not. So it's just something I'd like to see built into, um, well, it's not really in our government, but it would be something that would be considered a standardized building code in Delaware County. I've heard that mentioned from some of the other towns as well. They, the towns generally have an interest in doing that. Um, we're trying to manage fire concerns, like with subdivisions, making sure there's two access points and having you know the outside part, obviously not not the, the, the physical structural part of it. Um, we aren't we aren't managing that or regulating that. Um, but yes, I mean, like I said, I know people have different opinions of the building codes. California, where there's also coastal regulations on top of all of that. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very familiar with, with all of that and, and what fires can, can do. As well as our yeah. Thank goodness we don't have a lot right. of Right. We don't have to yeah, <laughs> <out> of that. <laughs> well, the next item on the agenda is the conference plan discussion. And you're welcome to stay and guide us or help us or give us your expertise. That if you want, sure. uh, if you want to get back to the building, we certainly understand, but I don't know why anyone <laughs> want to leave the <laughs> But um, this is uh, the thing I'm concerned about having the comprehension plan discussion is we have two members with here. Right. Um, I think you could throw out a few ideas, but uh, really, as far as trying to make decisions and stuff, I really think we should have a full board, maybe one of the most. Um, uh, one of the most helpful uh, things we could do right now is maybe set 
a goal for the next meeting and get that posted and get that on everyone's calendar so that we can uh, have that more robust discussion. Well, I, what we're, I guess my understanding of what we're trying to look at today is the first step in putting out an RFP to hire somebody to do this versus we as a planning commission would be doing this if we don't have an RFP and have somebody drive this. And does the planning commission actually feel that we have the capacity to write a master plan? Well, let's let's separate the tasks out. Um, one of the things with the compliment has some plan. I think we had a really good start on that. Several years ago with that involvement. This year he ran a couple of mm -hmm. uh, a series of meetings that were well attended by the public that really started to inform what could have been the nuts and bolts of a plan. That was years ago, three years ago, I guess. And then we just started again. Now, those kind of meetings are really helpful if we have the assistance of like right a technical writer or someone that could be writing for us and capturing those things. Because for us as volunteers to be trying to you volunteered to write up everything that was on the switch. That was a sizable task. I'm already working on the summary. Yeah, I would doubt the commission would want to do something like that. That's a lot of work. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. 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 Yeah, that's 14 pages long, that is not a condensation of what we need for a general plan. Our general plan is 30 pages max, maybe 40. It shouldn't be 200 pages. People won't digest it. So I'm thinking, like, if we can keep it simple with the commission and have sessions like we have and hire the writing support we need to do the creative writing for a document, I think it'd be helpful. You know, if we have that, so. Well, definitely having a writer, but I think someone also to be able to organize those sessions. And, you know, Sally volunteered to write that, but to have a trained facility. So again, get the, get the people that will write it, that will organize the meetings that will run. So really there's administrative support, there's facilitation, right. and there's writing, but with those three pieces of support, I think it's easier for the commission to be able forward on right, and that's, plan, I think yeah. that's what the RFP would be about. You would be hiring those pieces that we need and then we can be in control. I mean, one of the things that we can talk about when we hire these people is we don't want a 200 page plan. Yeah, Here's what we want because when we originally started this whole process three years ago, two years ago, we oh, talked about yeah. having yeah, a 30 page document yeah, yeah, exactly. that's what we were aiming for something that having a, an abbreviated thing that actually could be a pamphlet that you could do the whole thing and then the larger document that would feed into the pamphlet but something like that so that could be outlined right. as to what our needs are in that rfp i think the thing that's hard for us is like trying to keep plan as reflective of what the because we, and I'm not trying to denigrate the planning commissions or the planning profession, because some of my best friends are planners, and I know I appreciate what they do, but a lot of what planners bring is stuff to larger communities, and we're not that big. And that's the thing that I think is, is harder for me when I went through the experience with planning and mm -hmm. There's a lot of good ideas in there, but it's hard for people to wade through. Mm -hmm. So if I may add that, um, so what we've gleaned from a lot of these meetings lately, and I believe someone even stated it recently at one of our board meetings, was that what they've really come to find is the more we're doing these meetings to do an update on our master plan, the more they realize that there's not actually a lot that needs to be updated. There's some, but a lot of the overall feelings of the community are, are primarily the same when it comes to development, land use, yeah. growth restrictions, things like that. Awesome. Right. So um, that was what we, why we brought it back to the planning commission again, is because that is where the building, this update should start and end. Um, initially, we had a planning commission who said, contract out the whole thing. Town's budgeted for that process. Um, 
$70,000 for a master plan update um, for this year. That is what's in the budget. Um, now, since then, there is a grant opportunity actually that would include 25000 for an admin grant that we're looking at that um, would bring that down so we can free up some of that capital planning funds. Um, but then what we had a change in the planning commission structure and we actually had a planning commission member who isn't here that said, hey, I really don't think we have to just hand off the whole ball and let somebody else do this, similar to the direction you were uh, speaking of. So now that we have a full board again, even though we have a couple that are absent today, um, we have a full commission, five, five members. Um, that was why we were bringing it back. Just again, to confirm that we want to begin the process of the RFP and what specifically the main points are that we're looking for. So it would be a, a succinct document. Yeah. Um, now, as far as the Paleon motion, um, if you go back to the original advertisement for that, the intention always was that while that would be into the master plan, it was supposed to be a standalone document. Nobody asked that it be that big, but as a standalone that's really specific only to Parks Trail and Recreation, that's part of the reason why it's as large as it is. So just clearly identifying the three aspects that you're looking for, which is the facilitation, the administrative assistance, the facilitation, and the actual drafting of the final update, um, knowing those things as the, the main pieces, then it would be uh, part of that RFP as well would be um, a scheduling of a consistent meeting with the planning commission where they would be coming to you. Um, you know, it'd be good as to have the other two commissioners and on this with us to be able to uh, it, it be incorporated in that decision. So I'm wondering if you could send out a doodle poll to them to see if they're available in the next couple of weeks and see if we can get another meeting scheduled, because it'd be really good to have everyone on the same page where we want to go with this and to fully discuss the RFP. And the thing I also like about an RFP for specific skills is the chances of us being able to hire locals for this would be really high. There are a lot of really good writers in the community here. There are good facilitators in the community. Um, Sally might want to give us a <laughs> <laughs> Sally has the time. Be to do that. But there are facilitators, there are writers. Maybe there's, I know for sure, there is a planner in town that, Two. that we met at the Two. Planning. Two. Planning. Yeah. There's more than one that yeah. might be technical advice. So mm -hmm. we might be able to, instead of spending the grant money in some out of town firm, we might be able to hire, hire local citizens to help us with this effort. So, yeah, and I think that's, that's what I suggest as a path forward. And I so think that's a great idea, but I don't want this pushed off and pushed off and pushed off and pushed off, yeah. which is kind of what we've done. I would like to sit, see it. Let's get a meeting. Let's make a yeah, there's plan. There's some urgency. Let's, yeah. yeah, let's yeah. get it done. Yeah. And that was absolutely. And that's why I'm suggesting a Google poll in the next two weeks or three weeks at the outside so that we actually get all five of us together <laughs> and we get that part of people. I was just going to suggest, can we place ads in like the shopper, the DCI, That's looking for doing. someone in the North Fork Valley that's interested in that? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah we can do it. Well, we need to get the commission on board. I'll look forward. Now, what we want, and then we haven't met since it. February. This is a big surprise. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, let's let's move on. Let's get it done. So is there a cap on how many people can be on the planning and zoning board? Or is it at five? Or is yes, it five? It's five. It's five. It's five. Right. And just a quick point of order: Is there a quorum here today? Because I yes. thought a quorum was however many on the board. Put it in half and then add one. So that would well, be two, two, and half. two and a half. No, it's it's majority. Right. So it's I just wonder, right. okay. Um, yeah, it would be nice if it was coming from the planning and zoning people that could actually do the master plan because that's what is designated. And if you did that, like Barb said, just cast that out and maybe, because I think Barb, not that you're not going to be on again, but I think your term was up last month and you weren't reassigned onto the board again. No, no, it just wasn't updated on the website. She was reappointed last year. 
last year. Yes. And then it's okay. two years. Right. Got it. Okay. And typically, the board, the planning commission doesn't write the master plan. Hotchkiss did that, but most communities do contract out. Even ours was done, was not done in house. The one from ninety six. So the ordinance doesn't say that. It's it says the planning commission runs the process, but not that they're responsible to actually draft. But it doesn't say they're not. No, no. But that's what I was just saying. I was just clarifying that they actually typically they don't. Hotchkiss did, but I know that their town attorney said that he did not. So is that something doable current? Uh, yes, absolutely. Are doable and see what we get. Yes. Is there anything else to come before the commission? Thanks for your Thank presentation you. and concert oh, to pay Thank you. Thank you. I think you're just coming twice. <laughs> <laughs> it's not to make it work. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. very much. I appreciate the input from you all too. Okay. okay. If there's nothing to